Thank you, Connie. Wasn't that beautiful? Amen. Blessed. If you would, go ahead and turn with me in your copies of God's Word. This morning we're going to be looking at James uh, chapter 1 as we begin a brand new sermon series as we launch into this new year uh, titled Focus. I don't know about you, but just uh, getting past or getting through or getting over or whatever you want to say, uh, the, the Christmas season, uh, it, it seems like the holiday season can be chaotic at times. Anybody agree? I just had a conversation with a young lady this morning, and we talked about just that, of how chaotic uh, the Christmas season is within their family and, uh, um, and how she is ready for some, I guess, uh, a time to not be so busy. Well, the reality is in life, sometimes we get so busy, busy that we become distracted. Uh, some of us are really easily distracted. Some of you are really distracted right now. I can tell by looking at you, you're looking in other places, and that's okay. Well, life is full of distractions that lead us down paths of empty pursuits. What I mean by empty pursuits is sometimes we set out to do, maybe intentionally doing the right thing, but we're actually investing more time, more effort, more money, more whatever into areas that really have no meaning. It, it, it is areas in our life that is not lasting. Such distractions are not only present in our individual lives, but they are also present within the church. And that's what we're going to be talking about this morning, specifically, if not just our own lives, but how often that we as God's people, how we as the body of Christ, how we, yes, First Baptist Church of Morton, Illinois, sometimes we become distracted. We become distracted by the mediocre things, by the things that really don't matter, and, and we lose sight of where God is leading. We lose sight of where God is calling us to go. So the mission, the mission of the church, has been given to us. There's no question about it. There's no guess. There's no pondering or trying to figure out what is our purpose in life. What is the purpose of the church? Because why? Jesus gave it to us. He gave it to us in Matthew. And in, in Matthew 28, he says this. He says, go therefore and make disciples of who? All nations. So if we, as the church, if Jesus is talking to the church, which I believe he is, then we have been called to go and to reach the nations. We've been called to go and to reach the community with the good news of the gospel. It is the greatest news, and you've heard me say this before, it is the greatest news ever told that's hardly ever told. And what I mean by that, we as believers, we fail. We fail. Why do we fail? Because we become distracted. We become distracted by other secular means. We become distracted by the busyness in life. And we become distracted from the ultimate vision or ultimate plan and mission that Jesus Christ has given us as the church. So, sometimes we lose sight on his mission, who is Jesus Christ, on his mission uh, for our lives. Therefore, we create substitutes to fill our time and define our purpose. Anybody here ever create a substitute? Right? You know what a substitute is? It's something that fills in uh, into a place that, that uh, originally was meant to be something else or someone else. Uh, such substitutions not only lead us toward empty pursuits, but they also keep us from fulfilling the true mission and purpose that God has given us. This past week, I learned... Uh, about a new place in Peoria, Illinois. Many of you may be familiar with this place. As you cross over the bridge, entering into Peoria, on the right-hand side off the interstate, there is a big church. It used to be a Presbyterian church years ago. Now, I don't know the history of the church, and I don't know what happened or why it, it is no longer a church, but, but this building was erected back in the mid-1800s, and again, it was a Presbyterian church, and for whatever reason, the church is no longer there. Now, if you go to that same place, it's a restaurant. You can enter into it, and it's a big cathedral ceilings, and uh, it's a huge building, and it's a restaurant. So when I saw that, the, big, the, the main question, like I said, I don't know the history. I don't know why the church is no longer there. I don't know if they relocated or if they closed. But what comes to mind is the question, what happened? Because here we have Peoria and the surrounding areas that's full of many people from many nations who do not know Jesus. And if there is a church in, in a place that is full of so many lost people that closes its doors, something is wrong with the vision of that church. Something is wrong with the vision of that church. Like I said, I don't know. Uh, maybe the church relocated and that was just an empty building. I don't know that. So, so the question is, 
what is going to happen here at First Baptist Church. I cannot tell you if this church is going to stand until Jesus comes. I cannot tell you if this church is going to be open another 10, 20, 30, 50, 100, 200 years. I don't know that. But what I do know, without a vision, people perish. Meaning, if we don't have a vision, if we don't have a focus as a church going into this new year, then we are not going to fulfill God's plan. We are not going to fulfill the commission in which he has given us here today. Many years ago, my daughter, she was about three years old. I can talk, to, talk about her right now because she's not here today. Uh, she's with her grandmother, so I'll talk about her and, and just don't tell her, okay? Uh, so my daughter, when she was about three years old, uh, we were center, sending her to preschool. Uh, she was entering into school, and for those of you who are parents of children, you know when you send your child to school or preschool, they have to have an eye exam and uh, to test their eyes. And I remember we sent her, and they, they had an eye doctor that came to the preschool and was, was doing the eye exams. And we found out at that moment uh, that her eyesight, and, and one eye, and I don't remember the, the numbers exactly. I think one eye was like 400, um, and I, I don't remember the other eye. Uh, but long story short, she was almost blind. I mean, her, she could not see and, and it, it kind of made me feel bad as the dad because uh, I did not notice that. And many of you have had children go around the house looking for something that, that they misplaced. And what do you say? It's right there. Are you blind? Right? So at, at that point, I felt guilty because in reality, she was, and I did not know that. But I remember when my, my daughter got glasses for the very first time. And, and she received these glasses and I remember we were outside, we were standing in the backyard, and she was looking up at the trees. Now, what I did not know until that moment is at that moment was the first time that my daughter could actually see leaves. Before that, everything was a green blur. Some of you are shaking your head, maybe you've gone through something similar. It was a green blur. But what happened? Her vision... Right? Her vision was corrected. We as the church, sometimes we're going through life, and we may not know it, we may not recognize it, but, but we see a big blur. We don't know what, where God is leading or where he is calling or what he, is, he has commissioned us to do because we need to correct our vision. And that's what the sermon is about. That's what the sermon series is going to be about, how we as First Baptist Church of Morton, Illinois, can have an eye exam... Don't worry, I'm not going to make you read a chart this morning. You can read your bulletin or the, the screen up behind me. Uh, but we want to make sure that our focus is in the right place. We want to make sure as the church, as God's people, that our focus is on who? On Jesus. It's on Jesus. So in honor of reading God's word, if you could please stand with me here this morning as we look again at, at James chapter 1, verses 2 through 12. And it reads, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him, let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For the person who must not suppose that, that he will receive anything from the Lord he is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation, and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with the scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also... Will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits? Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, 
He will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let us pray. Lord, gracious, heavenly Father, God, again, we thank you for this time that you've allowed us to gather in your presence. And God, we ask that you continue to move in our hearts, that you continue to move in our lives, that you continue to move through this church to help us be the church, the people, the body that you have called us to be, to go there for and to reach the nations with the good news, with the hope of Jesus Christ. And God, we thank you and I praise you for all you do and all you're going to do here through this place in the hearts and lives of the people. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. You may be seated. So hopefully this, uh, this sermon is going to be a little more interactive. At least I'm going to kind of pressure you to allow it to be more interactive with me. That doesn't mean um, I'm going to make you get up here, right? We don't want you getting up here like Dan and doing the floss or something like that because that would just be embarrassing for you. I don't want to embarrass you. I'll embarrass Dan, though. He's fun. Um, so, so again, I'm going to ask you four questions. These questions are going to help us um, identify our focus, as a church, as the body of Christ, remember, we're, we're not just talking about individuals, but we're talking about we as the church, as the church. So uh, this morning, again, we will examine four crucial, crucial questions uh, that will help, help us better understand our overall mission and how we as the church can focus on the path in which the Lord has laid before us. Who in here knows you believe with all your heart that God has a plan for your life? Who in here believes with all your heart that God has a plan for this church? I have a, I have a belief, like really big, that, that God has a plan for us here today. So, I don't know about you, but I don't want to live my life, my entire life, and then get to the end and realize that I blew it. How about you? I don't want to realize that I blew it. I, I don't want to realize that, that my many efforts, even my ministerial pursuits, have been in vain. I want to live a life that is glorifying to God. And I believe that we as the church, the only way that we can glorify God is by obeying his commandments, right? Is by fulfilling the commission in which he has given us as his people. So, question one, and you can this is what I mean by interaction. You can write your answers in your notes, or if you're using the YouVersion app, you can put your notes in there. So here's the question. Do you maintain a joyful attitude? Oh, that's a tough question, Pastor. Right? Do you maintain a joyful attitude? We see in verses 2 through 4, it says this. Uh, James speaking, he says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the, here it is, that the testing of your faith produces what? Steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So James, what, are, what is he talking about? What, what is James speaking about here in this, in this passage? What does it mean to, to test your faith. Has anybody ever felt that your faith was tested? Right? What does it mean to test your faith? Well, for those of you who are teachers, do we have any teachers in the room? Um, I know we do. Right? For those of you who are teachers, you know that testing a student helps, be, helps them better understand, and you better understand, the information retained and the ability to put into practice what the student has learned. Right? That's the whole point. That's the whole purpose of, of testing. Uh, this is a, a, there is a difference, and you know this, there is a difference between having knowledge of something and putting that something into practice, right? Many of us know things, but we don't always put what we know into practice, right? We, we can preach it, but do we live it out? Do we live it out? So, so testing can help a student and you and I uh, in the same to, to learn or to do two things. First, to learn what he knows. Helps us learn what we know, what we really know. Right? Some of us who have been students, we know you sit down and at that moment, as soon as you pick out your pencil and you're ready to write, what happens? <laughs> right? you, uh, your mind goes blank. Why? Why does it do that? It's because you don't really know what you what you're supposed to know, 
Right? You don't really know what you're supposed to know. So, so again, uh, uh, testing helps us learn what we know. Um, um, again, I'm not just talking about information, but I'm talking about transformation. It's transforming our heart. It's transforming our lives. But also, it helps us learn what we need to know. Right? In that moment, we sit down and realize that we should have, we should have did our homework or studied a little more uh, because we realize how much we don't know. Uh, as being one who've, who's gone through school, just graduated with my master's degree, I can tell you, the more I learn, the more I recognize how much I don't know. There's a lot that I don't know. There's a lot that I don't know. So again, uh, James is talking about this testing. Uh, likewise, the testing of trials helps us gauge the level of our faith. It helps us recognize where we really stand as a believer, as a, as a Christian, as a follower of Christ. Faith is not contingent on our own abilities. Did you know that? Faith is not contingent on your own abilities. Thus, it should not be affected by our weaknesses. So when trials come, and we face trials, even as a church, as a congregation, our faith can still stay firm. Why? It's because trials don't affect that. It's not circumstantial, right? But it's grounded on Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Faith is defined by our trust in Christ, in his ability despite our own comprehension. We may be growing. We may not know every answer to every question that has ever been asked about the Bible, but that's okay. That's okay. In other words, the, the passing grade uh, for the test that we're talking about here this morning is not an A. It is a J for joy or Jesus. Do you have joy? Even in the, the midst of trials, even as we go through days of difficulty and we, we pursue in steadfastness and we struggle. Who in here struggles? Who in here struggles in your faith? As a pastor, yes, there are days I wake up in the morning and I say, man, I really don't want to get out of bed. The, the, the pillow just feels so comfy, right? And uh, I, just, I just don't feel good. I don't feel like getting up. And then, then uh, uh, somebody tells me, you have to get up. You're the pastor. It's Sunday, right? So, so I have to roll out of bed. I have to get dressed and come to church. And we all have those days. Right? We all have those days, but, but in spite of our difficulty, in spite of our trials, in spite of ourselves, do we have joy in Jesus? Do we have joy? Can we find hope in knowing that he is overcome? So what do we mean by joy? What is joy? Joy is knowing that you're loved even when the world seems cruel and harsh. That is joy. Joy is knowing that there is hope for a better tomorrow, even when today is full of despair. That is hope. Joy is knowing that although we fail God, God will never fail us. That is joy. Joy is knowing that forgiveness has no expiration date. We are forgiven. Joy is knowing that, that sin does not own us and death cannot keep us. That is joy. That is joy. Just this week, I've encountered a couple families who have had a loved one pass away. A one is our dear, uh, dear brother, uh, Cliff. And I, and I can tell you, I can tell you, a man who has just lost his wife um, in, in the world's mindset would be in great despair. But I as the pastor and, and talking to, to Cliff, this is a man who has great joy. Why? It's because he has hope. He knows that his wife is not really gone, right? She's with Jesus. She's with Jesus. So again, joy, joy is, is knowing that, that we are forgiven, uh, that our forgiveness has no expiration joy. Joy is knowing that sin does not own us and death cannot keep us. Joy is knowing that one day for you, and one day for me that, that all things will pass away and the utmost good of God will stand alone. That is joy. That is joy. So again I say joy is not circumstantial. Joy is grounded on Jesus. It is rooted on Jesus. In other words, we will experience the joy that comes only from the glory of the Lord and Savior as we humbly bow before his throne 
as the church, it is my hope, it is my desire as the pastor of this church that we will humbly bow before our Savior and to not serve self but to serve Him. And the only way that we can serve Him is to remain focused in our overall mission on what Jesus has called us to do. To go therefore and to make disciples of all nations. For we see in Romans 14, 11 through 12, it says this, it says, For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to who? To God, right? Not your neighbor, not your parents, not your spouse, but to God. We will give an account to the Lord. We read in the, the book of Revelation, it says this. It says, He will wipe away every tear from our eyes, and there will be no mourning, there will be no death, or sorrow, or crying, or pain. All these things are gone for a little while. Does it say that? No. It says forever. Who in here is looking forward to that day? We have people in our community, family members, neighbors, people who you work with who do not know that truth. And they are struggling because they are facing a time in their life of hardship. They are facing a time in their life of pain. They are facing a time in their life of suffering. And they don't know the good news that Jesus has overcome that. Why don't they know that? It's because you haven't told them. Because I haven't told them. Because we have not yet told them. So joy is always accompanied by steadfastness, and steadfastness is produced by true faith in Christ despite one's circumstances. As the church, we will face trying times. It's obvious. It's inevitable. However, with joyful hearts, we will prevail. With joyful hearts, we will prevail. I like what Charles Hayden Spurgeon uh, once wrote of what he calls holy joy. And he says this, he says, Holy joy will oil the wheels of your life's machinery. Holy joy will strengthen you for your daily labor. Holy joy will beautify you and give you an influence over the lives of others. Do you have joy in Jesus? Do you have joy in Jesus? So we answer the question, do you maintain a joyful attitude no matter what the circumstance may be? Also, are you mindful of godly wisdom? Are you mindful of godly wisdom? It says in verses 5 through 8 of our text, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him... Ask in faith, without, with, with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he is a double-minded man, unstable in his own way. I find the first part of this, this passage a little odd. As we, as we look. And the reason I find this a little odd is we, if we look at James' statement, he says this, I'll read it again. He says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously. So the reason I think that's very odd is because the fact uh, that, that seems odd to me is the reality that all wisdom comes from who? It comes from God. So if all wisdom comes from God, then that must mean we all lack wisdom without him. We all lack wisdom without him. For the prophet, or, or, or it is written in the Proverbs, it says this. It says, all wisdom is from the Lord, and so do common sense and understanding. So you might be thinking, well, pastor, does that mean that, that if you're not a, a Christian that you're an idiot? <laughs> right? I don't know about you, but I know some very intelligent people on the surface, very intelligent people who are, who are not Christians. Right? Some of the most intelligent people I've ever uh, talked to were, were actually atheists in that sense. But the reality is, when we talk about wisdom, uh, it is not that I'm saying that they're idiots. However, I would say that in, eternal sense, in an eternal sense, it is foolish to turn away from God. 
And many, very, uh, uh, many men and women who seem to have their head on their shoulders have done just that. And what does Scripture say about it? Well, Scripture says in Proverbs 28, 26, it says, whoever trusts in his own mind is what? Is a fool. But he who walks in wisdom will be delivered. He will be delivered. Godly wisdom is not only knowing the truth, but it is also knowing how to apply the truth for the, for the glory of God in the advancement of his mission in your life. That is wisdom. Because we can know a lot of information, but again, going back, it's, it's not about knowing the information, it's about what are we going to do with it. You can know a lot uh, about, um, you, can, you can know a lot about nuclear energy, and you can do a lot of good things with that knowledge, but you can also do a lot of bad things with that knowledge. So the question is, what are you going to do with the information you have received? Because we can receive a lot of information, we can receive a lot of Bible training, but what are we going to do with it? Many of us, and I say us as the church as a whole, the universal church, many times we, we are good at gathering information, but we just sit on it. We're not going, therefore, making disciples. We're not going and reaching the nations with the good news of Jesus Christ. Who in here has ever been, uh, been told, maybe by your parents or, or a teacher or somebody, um, uh, that, that if you eat carrots... Right? It's good for your eyes. You ever been told that? Okay. So, where does that come from? Well, the most, most important technological uh, breakthrough of the 1940s was something that was known as the H2X, H2X Mickey, uh, which was a, it was a ground scanning radar uh, system that, that was used for blind bombing during World War II. Right? So, without any sight, the pilots were able to use that radar and pinpoint where they wanted to drop the bombs, not, not being able to see their target. Right? That's, that's good technology if, if uh, you're the one using it. Uh, it. It has been said that, that without such a system, the end of the war would have had much different results. Without that system, it would have had much different results. Uh, British and American pilots were able to fly into Nazi territories without being detected and drop bombs on the enemy. The Nazi party was confused on how these pilots could, could maneuver such tactics in the, dead, in the dead of night without the ability of seeing their target. Well, in hopes to farther confuse their enemy, the, Br the British and Americans fabricated a story that the army was feeding their pilots carrots so it improved their eyes. So now you know where that came from. So if your parents ever told you that, they lied to you. Just saying. So the moral of the story is this. Don't be deceived like the Nazis. And many times we as, as Christians, many times we as the church, we think we're doing the right thing. We think we're, we're on mission with God, but our mission is our mission. It's not his mission. Right? We want to do his mission, not our own mission. So we must understand all wisdom is, is, it is rooted in God and God alone. Wisdom forms a central part of, of who God's natural, uh, his, his natural attribute, his natural character Thus, wisdom is something that we inherit from God for the sole purpose of reflecting his holy character. That's why God gives us wisdom. It's so we can reflect God in our own lives. So we can reflect him to who? To the nations. To the world around us. So wisdom, wisdom produces integrity. If, if we have wisdom, then we also have integrity. What is integrity? Here it is. Doing the right thing, even when no one's looking. Doing the right thing, even when nobody is looking. So we, so we see wisdom produces integrity. Wisdom produces self-control. Has anybody ever struggled with self-control? I'm not just talking about sinning, but I'm talking about uh, just not taking the time to think things out and acting or reacting uh, to something that we should have sat out in the first place.
So wisdom is, it, it produces self-control. Wisdom produces a love for truth. Do you have a desire for truth? Who in here has ever heard the, the word a philosophy? Right? Philosophy derives from two, two Greek words. Um, it, it, it comes from the word phileo, right? Which means what? Love, right? Love. And it also comes from the word sophia, which means to be wise. So when we talk about philosophy, we're talking about a love to be wise. We have a desire to know the truth. Now, I'm not talking about secular truth or the truth of the world or the deceptions that have been fed to us uh, through our education, but no offense to your teachers, but here's the reality. Truth, again, comes from God. It is truth about God. Who is God? It is truth about man or humanity. Who are we? And it is also truth about our existence or the existence of both God and and us what is our purpose what he has has god called us to do jesus tells us in a parable he shares in matthew chapter 7 he says this he says everyone then who hears these words it is his words and does and does them will be like a wise man who builds his house on a rock and when the when, when the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on the house, but it did not fall. Why? Because it has been grounded, founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who builds his house on the sand. And the rains fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. So what's Jesus talking about? He's talking about wisdom. He's talking about, do we take what God has, has given us, not just information, but does it transform our lives? Do we apply it to our lives? Again, James says, he writes, going back to our text, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him do what? Let him ask God. When is the last time that you prayed that you pray that God would open your eyes to the mission that he has for your church. We should do that all the time. We should be doing that all the time. If, if we want to be on mission with God, if we want to, want to do what he has called us to do, if we want to be obedient, then we should seek him and he will guide us. He will lead us. Verse 6 goes on and says, But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be tossed by the wind. I don't want to be living my life just going through the motions. I don't want to be living my life and serving here in this church just maintaining my busyness. I don't want to be busy. I want to be useful. I want to be useful to God because it's easy, and you know this, it's easy for us to keep busy, but we're not called to keep busy. We're, we're called to stay faithful. We're called to stay faithful to the Lord. So do you maintain a joyful attitude? Are you mindful of godly wisdom? And number three, the third question we must ask ourselves is, is do you model a humble spirit? Do you model a humble spirit? Here's the thing. I hope I don't hurt anyone's feelings here. It's not about you. It's not about me. Even my own salvation, even in which the things I benefit from, is not about me. It's about him. It's about Jesus. So do you model a humble spirit? Verse 9 through 11 says this. It says, Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation, and the rich in his humiliation. Because like a flower of the grass, he will, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. So what is James talking about here? Well, in simple terms... James is telling his readers to be careful where they place their security. It's not about bigger buildings, larger budgets, and more butts and seats, right? It's not about that. 
Are we going to the nations? Are we being obedient? Are we faithful to the commission that he has given us? Are we faithful in spite of our circumstances? I like what the prophet Jeremiah says. He talks about, he talks about this in Jeremiah 17, 7 through 8. He says, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He is, the, he is like a tree planted by water that sends its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes. For, it leaves, for, for its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of the drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. Why? It's because it is rooted by the stream. The reality of this passage, we're going to face difficult times. You're going to face difficult times. The heat is inevitable. We will face the heat. But we can stand firm on the truth of knowing that we are secure in, in Christ. We are secure in Him. So to trust in the Lord is to maintain a spirit of humility. Again, it's not about me. It's about Jesus. A humble man is not a pushover. It does not mean that, that you are a pushover because you are, you are humble. A humble man is one who recognizes the true source of his strength, and that is God alone. That's what it means to be humble. It is to recognize your true strength that is not in yourself, but it is in God. For it is written by the Apostle Paul in, in 2 Corinthians 12.10. It says this, For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then what? Then I am strong. So it's going to be difficult, church. Going into this new year and fulfilling the commission which God has given not an easy task. But we have strength that goes that is stronger than ourselves. And that is in Christ, in Christ alone. So do you maintain a joyful attitude? Are you mindful of godly wisdom? Do you model a humble spirit? And lastly, the last question, are you motivated to persevere? Has anybody ever here ever faced discouragement? I'm going to be transparent with you right now. Can I be transparent? And some of you who have been in ministry, you know what I'm about ready to talk about, or you, you will in a minute. Um, but ministry is a very lonely place. It can be very discouraging. Because as, as a pastor... Or, or, or in minister, sometimes you seek out and you love the people that you're serving, but sometimes they're not very lovely. And what I mean by that is they're not very kind. And as, as a pastor, sometimes you seek out and you, you're serving God and you're doing the right thing, but it seems like you're going through a long season of drought. So in those, in those moments, it is our faith that gets us through. In those moments, we are motivated not by the moment, but we are motivated by the promise. We persevere. In ministry, we persevere. It says in verse 12, it says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, here it is, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Growing up as, as a kid, and even as an adult, uh, one of my family's favorite, per, favorite pastimes every four years uh, was to watch on TV the Summer Olympics. Is anybody here watching the Summer Olympics? The Olympics, uh, I don't know if you knew this, but the Olympics is one of the world's oldest sporting competitions. It was uh, the Olympics as we know it today, began in April 6, 1868, uh, in Athens, Greece, uh, with a total of 14 countries that participated. However, the history of the Olympics goes all the way back to the ancient world. So when a winner, or an Olympian, was declared, uh, declared the winner, he, uh, and yes, he, women weren't allowed to be in the Olympics at the beginning, but he would receive uh, what was known as a, uh, a laurel wreath that would be placed on his head. 
he would be crowned by this laurel wreath. And, and this wreath was a symbol of triumph. It was a symbol for him for triumph. So in our text, when James is saying, in essence, he says, if you remain steadfast in your faith and persevere through the difficulties, you will be triumph. You will triumph and receive the reward in which you have been promised. In other words, he is saying, you will overcome. That's what it means to be crowned. You will overcome. You will overcome the penalty of your sin. You will overcome the power of sin. You will overcome, yes, one day, the presence of sin. And I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to that day. So according to James, we must count it all joy. Even when trials come, we must maintain our faith. True faith is always followed by obedience. If we are if we truly have saying that works, uh, that, that we're saved by works, but we are saved to do works, and it is by our faith we're saved, but it's through our works, right, we prove our faith. Right? If, if we truly have faith, if we truly trust in God, then our lives will show it. It says, Jesus says in John 13, He says this, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this all people, all people will know that you are my disciples if you what? If you have love for one another. Church, do you love one another? Do you love your brother? Do you love your sister? Do you love your neighbor? Do you love your coworker, your schoolmate? Do you love the people around you? And many times in our lives, and I say are all, are as plural, many times in our lives, we don't show our love. Did you know the most loving thing that you, church, can do for another person is not marry them, is to share Jesus with them. And the most loving thing that we can do, a per, do for a person is something that oftentimes we choose not to do. So will you turn your eyes on Jesus today? Will you trust in Him alone to direct your path in life? Will you, will you take His hand and allow Him to lead you this morning in taking that next step in your faith? As we enter into this new year, I want to I live a life that is glorifying to God. I want to live a life that is pleasing to Him as we go therefore together and focus on His mission, reaching the nations with the good news of Jesus Christ. So will you receive Christ today as your Lord and personal Savior? Will you rededicate your life? In following him, or will you join a small group or, or a community of faithful followers of Jesus Christ? Will you become a covenant member here, as some of you have in the last couple of weeks here at First Baptist Church of Morton? Will you follow the Lord in believers' baptism? Will you seek the Lord in desperate prayer? Will you trust in the Lord throughout 2020? As we, First Baptist Church, of Morton seek to fulfill our overall mission connecting with our communities by meeting people where they are just as Jesus did that is our focus of 2020 so whatever your next step may be today is the day to trust in the Lord will you trust in the Lord today will you go with me as we seek to follow Christ in 2020 to go and to connect with our communities by meeting people where they are, just as Jesus did. If that's your desire, stand with me here today. Let us pray. Lord gracious, Heavenly Father, God, I thank you, Lord, for the men and women, the boys and the girls who've gathered here in your presence. And God, I ask that you continue to move in our hearts, that you continue to direct our steps, that you continue to help us be faithful in obedience and know that no matter what we face, no matter how difficult the task before us may be, that we can trust in you. 
And God, I ask that you move in our hearts, you move again in our lives, that you help us be your church, that you help us be your people. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen.